Hello and welcome back to the Talking Leadership TV podcast series. Thank you for joining us again. My guest today is Joy Cornell. She is a coach, facilitator, author, speaker, and servant leader, and is a publisher who provides others with a platform to share their stories through the Permission to Flourish anthology series. Focusing on leadership development, Jai has inspired professionals in a range of industries, including aerospace. Beyond her work, Jai is committed to philanthropy and community service, using her expertise to promote positive change and a culture of support and empowerment. Her work as an author and entrepreneur demonstrates her dedication to creating accessible opportunities for brand growth. Jai encourages others to lead meaningful, enthusiastic lives and to pursue prosperity with self-assurance. I know you're going to enjoy today's podcast. We discuss challenges to leadership, particularly in a post-COVID context. Thank you for joining us again, but enough from me. I'll hand over to Jai. Thanks, everyone, for joining us again on the podcast. I'd like to welcome Jai. Jai, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Our mutual friend, uh, Dre McLaughlin, put us in touch with each other to have this discussion. So thank you very much to Dre. And, uh, and I hope that he um, uh, listens to or watches this conversation in particular. So the discussion is going to focus on challenges to leaders. So uh, first things first, what do you see as some critical challenges at the moment to leadership from uh, your perspective, Jai? Yeah, you know, one thing that I've seen uh, here, especially here in the States, is now that COVID's over, it's more of the everyone shifted remote to hybrid prior. Now it's getting them to get back in the office. And a lot of leaders are having difficulty because a lot of people are, you know, especially for me, I see a lot of people saying, you know what, I'd rather give up my corporate position than have to start all over. My family is in a good place. We're able to have family time and we have the balance now. And before then, we were just on this, uh, you know, on this hamster wheel. We had to go to the office. We had to sit in traffic. Our kids went to daycare. Our kids went to school. Now it, I, I like the balance that I have. And so a lot of leaders are having that struggle of getting their employees back to the office. What worked before is not working now where they are seeing that they can't tell people, I'll give you a promotion or I'll give you a pay raise. They're like, no, it's not worth it because I have family time. So the things that happened before that would entice people are completely different today. And I, I noticed those challenges and even working with individuals uh, that I coach or that are in my uh, direct, you know, alignment. They're like, what do I do? How do I do that? And I'm like, do you know how many people are looking to get jobs? So really just changing the mindset and really having that that thought having one-on-one because what works for one industry may not work for the other yeah uh, well said i um have given this a little bit of thought and i've not been in a position where this is a challenge in in the world that i work i have um a colleague who works fully remote like i do so um there is no office space to to speak of and i've been working remote now since or oh, probably 2014 so it's been a good 10 years since I've been doing this so uh, and I've discussed this before when COVID hit it wasn't a an issue for me because I was already working remote so it didn't really change too much for me but I can understand where pre-COVID the office culture was the dominant culture and then since uh well post-COVID and and I would say at least during COVID that thinking needed to change um yeah, 100% agree that it would be a challenge if organisations now, which is a little worrying, want to go back to the old ways of operating. And I think it's thrown up something that is often discussed, but I don't think given the value that you just um, outlined in the discussion here around what does balance look like for your employees versus what you think is essential for the operation of the business and 100% agree also that it depends on the industry. So if you're a white collar worker or you provide services that don't need a physical presence, the working from home debate is a luxury you can afford to have with an employer. But if you're in the medical field, if you're an emergency responder, you can't do those jobs sitting behind a a TV screen, sorry, a computer screen. It just 
physically wouldn't work. So um, 100% get it. I, I think and I, and I feel a lot of compassion for leaders that part of their team could work remote but the other part needs to be on site and so the tension between your blue and white collar workforces is only going to be exacerbated by everything that you've just raised there so before we get on to the questions uh the the other themes here sorry jai um what what kind of solutions are being thrown up to deal with the problem of your workforce wanting to be remote you don't have to name a particular, yeah. a, a particular client or, or person you're mentoring, but what are you hearing are some of the solutions to this? Yes, yeah, some of the solutions are a lot of people are pivoting and they're deciding, you know what, I'm going to take a new career. I don't need to have the nine to five. I like what I have and I just need to find a similar salary. And then you have others that are, okay, I'm the breadwinner and I have to make this transition. So they're going from two, uh, home household incomes to one income. And then the prices just keep rising. And a lot of them are like, okay, we need to find a way that I have a couple of people that I know that I've worked with that they actually hired a nanny and they do nanny sharing. So that way their children are with someone, but they can still bring in an income. And then you have other families that are, okay, our children are old enough to go to preschool. We can go ahead and we can survive having two incomes, we go back to normal because the job pays so well, they don't want to give up their life, their their lifestyle or their income. So we have so many different scales on the corporate level. But then the ones that really make the change, they're the ones that's excelling, and they're still happy. And then the ones that are still working the nine to five, they're upset because they don't have that flexibility and it's just draining on them because no longer can they just jump on the Zoom. They're like, oh, my God, I have to travel. I have to, you know, for me, I still work in corporate and I before the pandemic hit, I was traveling all over the world because that's where my customers were. They were everywhere. But when, you know, when things happen, everything shut down, I had to switch and pivot. And now I'm back traveling everywhere. So for me. And, it, and also another thing that plays in it is how many children you have, where are you at in your career and your, your life. And for me, because I'm an empty nester, my kids are grown and married, I have the flexibility to pivot. And that's another thing that's helping that's hard for a lot of parents is that they have younger children, you know, so it's, it's a generational thing, just dependent upon where people are in their life and what they're willing to give up or sacrifice or change. And so for me, it was easy to pivot, to go back to the office because they didn't have little ones. Some people talk about using that word um, family and that not being connected to them is a huge issue for people. I think it's underrated that depending on where you are in your career, if, if you've got young children, it's very difficult. If you're an empty nester, it poses a very different question and you're definitely at a different time in your career. But you could have kids that are on the cusp of adulthood and they still need their parents around. So I think those difficulties have often been ignored by some corporates and not by others. The implications of productivity for people working from home versus working in the office. Now, I know that some of that research has been done and I have a feeling that the um, there's an element to this around the communication bit where teams need to be eyeballing each other to be productive I think that's under challenge now despite the fact that yes there are some massive benefits to having people geographically in the same place talking to each other the the so-called um, water cooler culture has now changed and it's more how do you have those um, offline informal conversations you can still have them using the technology you don't physically have to be there so I think um the reversal of how we work has thrown up uh, fundamental challenges on how we think the world of work needs to be put together. And there will be different schools of thoughts on this. And, and you've, you've um, raised this that some employers will say, well, we're offering you work. If you don't like it, you know, we'll find somebody else. But there's also this idea of the quiet quitting and, and people staying in a job but actively looking elsewhere to find something that suits their lifestyle rather than uh, the employer's needs and goals. And 
it's yeah I, I think it's an ongoing conversation so you um what we've done so far in this conversation is we've talked very much post covid implications for businesses around challenges to to how leaders do what they do i want to ask you what what did you see changing through covid outside of what you've just talked about that really surprised you give me one thing that you saw that made you go oh shit this this is a real big change that we're still dealing with can can you identify something yeah so the, i think the biggest thing pre was how they were able to shift right you're in the office and then all of a sudden shift the whole world shut down and they were able to make it happen to go remote and it wasn't just the uh individuals that worked in a corporate setting that worked for big corporations the people that really suffered were the service workers i know for me it impacted my family because they were in the service industry being from the islands in hawaii how, you know hotels in the industry uh, not just the leaders but even their employees got furloughed and they didn't know if they were going to have a job the islands were shut down to everyone no one was flying so you had the airlines so the economy especially a lot of businesses that really rely on tourism to come in to help support that was huge to see it shut down especially being from the islands it was like wow and then the impacts that it had on the family and it wasn't just you know one or two families it was so many families and you still it was the service workers it was the restaurants the hotels and then you had individuals who were like okay what do we do how are we going to do it and a lot of panic set in so then people started panic buying they didn't know if they were going to have a home and it wasn't just people in leadership roles but it was everyone so having the you know it just depends again on the mindset having to have those talks with them For me my family was lucky because we came together and we worked to help everyone so that everyone wasn't suffering and they were able to have people that they can rely on and a lot of people doesn't don't have that. So for me my family was lucky however a lot of other families weren't. So that's where I was able to pivot and say how can I help other people in this pandemic to as we're going through it and i was offering my services for free just to have people for accountability talking what could they do where could they pivot and just offering things for free you know really having that servant mindset and whoever i could help wherever i could do it i i was there to even a lot of people just needed an ear and someone to have a sounding board off of so they could make that next decision what are they going to do how are they going to get it what programs are available and really digging deep because a lot of people they were so used to to their going to work 9 to 5 being in that leadership role but when their team just everything shut down they didn't know how to help their teams so they needed help themselves because they were so used to having everything in control there was no manual or a process to show them how to get through this it was something completely different and new yeah uh, words of wisdom there i, I think um pivoting back um and ironically to leadership i think a lot of leaders didn't have the skill sets to deal with the personal um emotional impacts on people through the pandemic and that's not a reflection on those that are in leadership roles it just um this this pandemic was not um expected it, it came out of the blue so to speak and it hit people significantly hard and and one thing you're mentioning there that I think needs a lot more discussion around is to what extent is the value of your network inside and outside business so when people didn't have the social world of their world of work if they didn't have a private social network outside of that to support them there are a lot of people that went through significantly difficult times because they had no one to as you said have a sounding board to talk about what what their issues were their fears maybe nothing related to work and i think and 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 uh all um i couldn't i couldn't compliment you more for doing that to help people out i think the the better leaders the best leaders that i've encountered did exactly what you did and offered a friendly ear rather than saying well let, let's have a formal discussion discussion in the work context it was more what can i do to get you over the hump uh cuz um you know people 
and and this is a human thing, I guess, is reverted to type. So you either you fought against what was happening and you pivoted, as you said, or you, you were completely isolated by this and didn't know what to do and sort of everything in between. And, um, yeah, I, I think there was no perfect response, but if you're getting back to the world of work, I think once the worst of the pandemic was over, and I'm not saying that there still aren't health implications for people and for those that lost loved ones through this, this is going to be an ongoing pain well beyond beyond the incident. It's it's more um, what did leaders learn through the process and and as challenges are being thrown up, are leaders reverting back to type and wanting things to go back the way that they were because I don't think that's a pathway that's going to be uh, productive. And um, I, I don't know in the States, but I know in Australia here there was some no, I won't name them, let, let's just call them some financial institutions that were very much pushing for people to be minimum number of days in the office. And I think when these institutions were quizzed on to why, particularly if they weren't front-facing roles, there is no response other than, oh, we just need to have the team here. And that speaks to that need to micromanage people. And that 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 still is an ongoing problem that, how do you coach or how do you get a leader over the need to micromanage their team when they've got other things that are more important than that in the first instance? And then secondly, how do you build trust enough so that you trust your people to do the job that they're employed to do? I've heard of this quite a bit. It hasn't happened to myself, so I don't know what my reaction would be, but I've heard a lot about this. Has this crossed your your desk at all this the the micromanagement issue yeah and you know they they the it's more of the they're saying what they say but there's a underlying thing that oh we need more collaboration in the office and you're like wait hold on prior to this we made it happen for three years now all of a sudden can you give us and and you know what the younger generation, this is just from my perspective, they're not afraid to ask those questions. Where the older generation is like, okay, back to normal, let's go. So you have a lot of different uh, ways that people are dealing with it, but you truly know it's micromanaging because there was no scientific proven evidence for those that could work from home all this time that it's required for them to be in the office. Like you said, it just depends on the scope of the work. You know, engineers, they can work from home unless they have to go and touch the item that they're building. Those that are in contracting, they can work at home. Those that are in compliance, those that are not, you know, um, administrators in a hospital, majority of the time they can work from home. However, if you're a nurse, a doctor, you do surgery, yes, it has to be in the setting. If you're a service worker working, whether it's a retail store and it's a physical brick and mortar, yes, you have to be there. Uh, our military service members, government, there's some positions that can be worked from home. There's some positions that can be worked that has to be in the field. It just, like you said earlier, it ha it just depended upon those roles. And I think a lot of things that's happening to here that just kind of hit me is AI. With AI coming up so quick and so easy, a lot of these jobs that used to be remote may not be here in the next few years. So there's that too to take into consideration that a lot of people may be afraid of that we haven't even start to think about those things yet. We're still trying to reassess what happened pre post COVID and then trying to get in the uh, don't 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 take us down the AI rabbit hole. That uh that that's a whole nother set right? of conversations, <laughs> Jai. Yeah. Uh, I, so, I but for what this is lot. worth, um Jai, I think the AI um buzz that's been around and I'm I'm only talking from an Australian perspective and this isn't my personal view only, I think it's been blown out of proportion to the, the extent that certain jobs are going to be replaced by AI. that There may be some truth to that, but AI can't replace how people think and the creation of innovation and ideas and uh, that entrepreneurial spirit that lives in people. That That's never going to be replaced by AI, Absolutely. and that's a different conversation around that Hollywood perspective around AI becoming self-aware is just that. It's a movie trope. It's... It's fantasy, but yeah, um, 
I think what you're talking about, and I agree 100%, is the issue around technology that um, how will employers go, right, well, if you don't want to come into the office, we're going to try and find a way to automate what we do so we don't need you. And um, that, that may be true for some industries, but for others, that's never going to be the case. And I think on both sides, you have to be careful how much you push back on this because at the end of the day, employers need good people. They need to build future leaders they need to build the longevity of a business and um, partner language but if you start pissing people off and and not worry worry about their needs um, to ba- to balance what they do in the world of work I think you're going to find that your longevity is going to be questioned quite significantly this has been a really interesting conversation so let me let me pivot here for a second and ask you the following. You have spoken to a lot of leaders, you're, you're coaching, you understand this environment. What would you say is your top three tips for leaders around dealing with challenges, whether it's post-COVID or just in that leadership space more broadly? Yeah, I think the biggest tip, and as we were talking about it, is really remain humble because you have to listen to the words that they're saying and allow them a space to say it. Because a lot of people are always thinking for a response rather than actually hearing what the individual is saying, no matter who they are. And I think that really goes a long way because you want to build rapport and trust. And a lot of people always say authenticity, authenticity. Well, you know what? It's not only about authenticity. It's about you being humble and being congruent because you got to build that relationship with the person. They're not going to trust you right off the back, especially if, if you were one of those individuals that, you know, let me do, let me tell you what to do. And I'm not going to show you, I'm telling you. So I really believe the biggest tip is remaining humble, put your pride and ego on the side. And the last thing that I would really say is walk the walk with the talk. Don't just talk it, show them that you are able to do it because example setting Being the example that people want to see really goes a long way, especially if you're expecting someone to do something. Joy, that's an excellent way to conclude the discussion. Thank you for your time today. This has been excellent. Thank you. For those listening, this has been the Talking Leadership TV podcast series. Thank you for following us. Have a great day, rest of your week, and we'll catch everyone on the next edition of the podcast.